Thanks for coming today. This is such a great crowd. You know, it's, it's so interesting. The last session was on why we still believe in Web3 in education. You know, not a, a totally full room, but I did hear that last year it was a standing room, <laughs> which is now converted over to AI, which is a, you know, it's interesting how things change. We find ourselves in a new environment here, but I think that that's why this maybe is still so relevant, because I think it represents some of the fundamental pieces that make the future really, really uh, inspiring still when it comes to some of these new technologies without you know, some of the, uh, the pieces that have arrived us in the strange place we are with Web3. So, so we have a, a wonderful panel today, each experts in their own right when it comes to digital credentialing and verifiable credentials, digital wallets, and you know, the future of education and employment in general. And so we're, we're going to try not to use acronyms today, okay? But for those of you who know, you know, LERs or learning and employment records is what really brings us here. You know, this is uh, what um, could transform the face of education and really bring us into a future where learners are at the center, which I think each of us share um, a passion for. So I want to let each of our panelists introduce themselves and tell us, you know, a little bit about themselves and why they're here. Great. Um, my name is Matt Patinsky. I'm the CEO of Parchment. Uh, Parchment works with around 6,000 high schools in the U.S. and about 2,000 universities to issue all different formats of academic credentials from transcripts, certificates, diplomas, badges, comprehensive learner records, and, and so on. We also work with the receiving side of credentials, so we're kind of like a network or an exchange, admissions offices, employers, licensing boards, certification boards, um, to facilitate turning those credentials into opportunities, which is our, our mission statement. And outside the US, we work on a global context in Australia, New Zealand, UK, Ireland, Canada, a number of countries, again, to bring credentialing from an analog and paper-based and manual world into an automated and, and digital world to help learners use them in enrollment and employment pathways. Hi, everybody. I'm Danny King. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of Accredible. Uh, we're one of the leading uh, badging and digital credentialing platforms. Uh, we represent about 2,000 um, educational institutions, professional associations, and others who issue their credentials through our platform. Hello, my name is Philip Schmidt. Uh, I'm the director of the Digital Credentials Consortium at MIT. It's a network of 12 higher education institutions. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time both designing and building the open standards that will underpin all of these new types of credentials and then building products and services and solutions for higher education institutions mostly. Hi, I'm Sharon Liu. I work at an organization called JFF, Jobs for the Future, and our goal is for 75 million um, people who face barriers to have access to good jobs. And I think the reason I'm here is because I think technology and access to your personal data can sometimes be one of the barriers that individuals face, whether it's techno like the technology itself, whether there are some policy or systematic issues around that. So really focusing on the use of digital credentials, uh, wallets that allow individuals to control their data and their credentials, um, and uh, maybe testing out in partnership with several people in this room of whether that actually provides opportunity. Yeah, thank you. So why don't we just get right into it? Why don't we start with the simple ones, just for those who maybe don't know a lot about this. What is a learning and employment record? What's an LER? Whoever would like to take it. Wow, I'm realizing where you sit really does matter. <laughs> so uh, with, with, I mean, Parchment, we, we start thinking um, about academic transcripts. So I think the simplest way to do it, to describe it, is in contrast to an academic transcript. So an academic transcript is an administrative record. It's controlled by the institution. It's official and valid if issued by that institution. It's describing things in courses and credits that are really for enrollment purposes, applying to college or transferring, going on to graduate school. Um, and it's you know fragmented and controlled by where you've learned. When I think about a learner, um, uh, um, employment record, uh, I think of something that's much more controlled by the learner as opposed to the institution. It's less about being an administrative record and more about being a portable representation of human capital, what someone knows and how well they know it. I think about it as serving purposes beyond inside the educational system and hence employment and helping them to advance. And I think about it in the context of really being lifelong so meant to expand and follow the learner as they go through their education and training journey. So it's a whole way of reconceptualizing how we document and represent um, human capital. Yeah, that's great. You know, and it, 
It's important, right, as we move into the future and we think about having lifelong learning portfolios. How does that really transform the way that education happens? Right? A lot of our big challenges is a learner leaves a school or a university or an employer and they disappear. We don't know what happens to them because so many of these systems are fragmented. And so I think this is a way for us to start getting at the continuity of lifelong learning. Um, and you can't really have a learning and employment record that is owned by an individual without a digital wallet, right? And when we think about digital wallets, uh, currently in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of contexts, it's about, it's about finance, it's about capital or, or cryptocurrency or currency, but really uh, it's about credentials at the end of the day. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about digital wallets, why they're important and how they fit into this? Yeah, shameless plug. Uh, we wrote a report on wallets last year, jff.org slash digital wallets, um, where we talk a little bit about the architecture of what we think is the actual learning and employment record. Um, and fundamentally, these digital credentials need to be built based on open standards so that any number of credential issuers can put their credentials into a wallet. So, you know, to your point, Matt, I'm imagining I have a high school transcript, I have a college one, and then maybe I earned a couple of accredible badges. How do I collect them to myself and then decide um, with whom to share? Um, and it could be, as you say, within the educational context, I'm applying for another college or a job, but um, like maybe I'm applying for a loan and they need to see that you know, I have a job in order to apply for the loan, right? So that's a way that my learning record and my employment record, if I control them, can be shared with um, actors outside of my immediate learning, lifelong learning journey to give me a benefit that I might need. Yeah, you know, I want to pull on you, uh, Philip, to help us understand what some of these use cases are. Like, how can we actually solve problems with this, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole range of use cases that would go from what we're very familiar with, is you get some kind of a record of your degree or your diploma and you're trying to get a job. And how do you share that credential with the potential employer in a way that um, gives them the trust that this is really a credential that you hold, that the institution that it says issued it, really issued it. And doing that in a way that doesn't always require you to send a fax to the registrar and pay $15 and they send a fax to the employer and it's like kind of a cumbersome, um, old fashioned process. So I, I think there's some improvements just to like the traditional way that we're doing things. I think it gets much more interesting when we move into this like lifelong learning space and combining credentials from various places because the reality is, um, the bachelor's degree right now is really the ticket to the middle class in the US, but very few people have a bachelor's degree, and most people who start to get a bachelor's degree don't finish it. And so how about all these other people who have amazing skills and competencies and experiences, but those are really hard to articulate in a way that seems legitimate. And so once you start thinking about LERs, and these credentials from a variety of providers are verifiable and you can trust that they really come from the providers that issued them, it gives access to these jobs to a much, much larger group of people. So I think that's the use case that we are most excited about. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, we, I always wonder if a learner has their lifelong learning portfolio, is this helping them with each of their teachers along the way to be more personalized and more thoughtful about how they can be educated? And, and I really think that's gonna be an important aspect of the future. You know, I, I wanna talk about something technical here. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. You know, the title of this is Blockchain and Learning and Employment Records. I wanna ask a, a question to this group. Do we need blockchains or are verifiable credentials and digital wallets enough? Are there benefits of one versus the other? I'll, uh, I'll start with this one. Um, we probably are the largest, um, have the largest network of blockchain-based credentials, um, but I wouldn't say that the blockchain is a necessary requirement, um, so let me try and qualify that a little bit. Um, we've issued about 60 million, 60 million credentials, and numbers doubling year on year at the moment, and um, one of the sort of options we, we give to our customers is to have a blockchain version of a, a credential as well. So it's a free additional thing, you know, we don't charge extra for it or anything like that. So we haven't put our hat in the ringers, hey, all credentials should be, um, blockchain-based. Um, the value that we've seen from implementing uh, a blockchain-based credential is in the verification. So we don't look at them as sort of tokens uh, or any sort of NFT or anything like that. It's not really about the portability or the ability to sort of transfer them around. It's more on the, when you click the verification button, um, it's a really good sort of uh, independent sort of, you know, th third party way to verify the information on the credential is correct and hasn't been modified, even if, for example, the institution doesn't exist in, say, 20 years. So I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think there's been a lot of interest in it, but there hasn't been a lot of sort of demand um, for um, anything outside of the security uh, implications of, or the verifiability of the credentials. Does anybody else want to follow up on a, on a different 
a view of that? Or? Yeah, I can follow up. And um, I mean, we built something called um, block certs a few years ago, my team at the MIT Media Lab, and we open sourced the code, and a company called Learning Machine took it and commercialized it. And it was built on, like, this was like an early experiment, really, for us. And we used the Bitcoin blockchain. And when we kind of dug into it, it was interesting to experiment with blockchains. You know, we are, we are a research institution, so it's like fun, new technology. Let's see what it can do. Um, and then when we kind of dug into it more, we realized that the only thing that the blockchain was ultimately useful for was the timestamp. Like, you had, like, you knew when the credential was issued, and you couldn't really lie about that. But all the other things, like who's the issuer, has the content been tampered with, who's the recipient, you can do all those things with, in other ways, public key infrastructures, et cetera. Um, so we ended up, um, I guess, moving away. I think you, you did the same, you offered it. You know, people didn't really, like there wasn't so much demand, so like, you know, it's good to experiment, it's good to try, but I think ultimately you can do all the things that we care about without blockchains. You know, and I think uh, the BlockSets um, experiment, we watched very closely and thought it was very interesting. I think one of the things that we saw um, in the wider community, both on the employer side and the sort of educational institution side, was, um, f first of all, you know, um, it, I, I think the blockchain verification does make it literally an order of magnitude more secure. It's much more hard to make a sort of falsified credential. Or, um, however, um, it doesn't really matter if it's too complicated for people to understand how to use. So if you need to have something like, a, you know, in, in this, literally you needed like, you know, a Bitcoin wallet, I think, in order to receive um, you know, many of the sort of implementations. And if people didn't know how or, or to use that or how to verify it, nobody did. Um, so for me, it had to be as simple as you click a button um, to yeah. verify. And you're right. You know, we, so we developed an open source package called LearnCard. And really going all in on verifiable credentials on our side, which I'd, I'd like to pull on Sharon a little bit to talk about this, because I think there is a new aspect of how we can solve a lot of these same challenges, but with verifiable credentials. And even, you know, everything an NFT can do, minus maybe its value layer, you can do with a programmable verifiable credential, but the friction just goes away, right? I mean, in fact, I mean, at the end, if you want to find one of our people, we'll give you a QR code, and you can actually get a DID on the spot and a VC on the spot, and it can happen in one second, you don't even know what happened. And I think that really is the differentiator, right? It's the friction of use. And I'm, I'm wondering, Sharon, if you could add to it, like where does verifiable credential fit into this and why is maybe this so important? Um, can I say something about blockchain first? Please. Um, Please. I don't want it to be false advertising. Like we said it in the title, so we all have to say it at least three times in our comments, like blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. blockchain, blockchain. blockchain. Okay. Um, but I do actually want to say, I think that um, the existence of like distributed ledger technology, the existence of these kinds of open standards um, really helps do something that's not just about changing the technology. I think it really flips the conversation. And I think this is the important point that I think you were alluding to earlier about like administrative data versus data about a person that a person controls. Um, and I think that there was a lot of benefit, especially in the early conversations about blockchain, just about this idea that I can control something about myself. Um, I understand my identity. It is like, I mean, I think the buzzwords are decentralized identifiers, you know, decentralized digital identity. But it, basically, it's there are characteristics um, and traits that describe my person, my activities, my abilities um, that I don't currently have control over because other people control and use that information. Um, and the interesting thing to me about a blockchain is, to your point, the permanence, um, and even when institutions close, tracking the timestamp, but more so that it is a way that we have started to pivot towards individuals having control over their identity and characteristics about themselves, and hopefully being the ones that profit from it. So, um, so we should continue to explore some of these things, and that was like one of the things that I want, but you seem like you want to argue with Yeah, me. just to build on that a little bit, I think of the adage, the medium is the message. Um, and I think there's a part of that that's true with LERs, and I think there's a piece of it that, that isn't. The piece that's true, the medium is the message, a medium in which an individual can really control and have agency over their records and where the ability to verify it is independent of its tethering to the institution. I think that is a really powerful message around what a credential is and, and, and um, and the kind of agency that learners should have. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about when it comes to blockchain is so less important than the actual content of the credential. Um, the big idea of an LER is we want a better representation of learning that's going to be more useful to the receiver to better understand the match in terms of whatever opportunity they're providing and the skills and competencies of the learner. 
and we are so far away from education providers and receivers of credentials articulating that and aligning it that we can innovate at the technology level in all sorts of ways, but it's not ultimately gonna help a credential turn into opportunity. So that was a very depressing statement, I realize. Um, but as I think about blockchain or any of these technologies, I think let's keep our eye on the ball of what do we really wanna represent in a credential and why. Yeah, and you know, I still wanna get into verifiable credentials as well, but, but I do wanna to speak to this too. You know, we in the last, in the last few months have been having conversations. And a lot of times when you're talking about these types of topics, you get relegated into the Web3 blockchain world. And, and I actually think this isn't good, right? Because I actually think what we're doing is we're creating real world solutions that can make the lives of learners better, that can make administrators lives better, teachers, everyone involved in the supply chain or the value chain of education and employment. Uh, and I think that it's important for us to start seeing that and to and start moving away from being focused on the technologies to being focused on the real world solutions that we can do. And I actually think it'll make us better as innovators as well because we'll uh, be able to climb out of the minutia a little bit and actually focus on what we're doing on the use cases and on the clear whys. And I think we've, it's been good, but over the past few years, we've all missed that a little bit in some ways because everybody's so focused on building, you know, that we kind of forget that what we're building are real solutions. And so... And so I say that to segue back into to verifiable credentials, and, and maybe I'll, I'll ask it in a different way. You know, why, how can we ensure interoperability, right, and standardization, and why is this so critical? Well, I'll start. I think organizations like One EdTech are actually doing amazing work here in trying to sort of build standards around credentialing. The W3C also have similar initiatives, a bunch of other uh, organizations too. Um, I think um, it, it does need time. Um, the analogy I often go to when asked about this is, um, if you look at things like, I, I grew up as a web developer, um, and if you look at sort of how the standards on the World Wide Web evolved and emerged, it wasn't an instant thing where everybody just agreed all the web browsers are gonna conform to all the same standards for you know, the code and the languages that we build them in, but over time there was a coalescence. And I think one of the, um, the reasons for it taking a while, um, you know, speaking as a vendor in the space, is um, in the early years there's a lot of innovation and we're still trying to figure out what exactly are the products and, and sort of um, how they should work that best meets the market needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very difficult to, you know, as soon as we all you know, adopt a standard, which almost all the companies in our space do conform to things like the open badging standards and so on, we then of course innovate and we add new things and then the standards need to be updated. So I think really the quick answer is um, uh, it's happening and I think there's a lot of interest and alignment um, across even competitive companies around this because I think we see the value, but um, you know, it's the early years of the, of the market and it's still in its infancy. Okay, I have a slightly different perspective and I'm not a technology company. JFF is very much not in the building anything game, but I'm going to impose my technology point of view on you, which is, um, you know, the verifiable credentials data model is actually a very legitimate standard and I think it's, um, it's usable in a lot of different contexts already. So maybe not as much in learning and employment, right, our space currently, but in supply chain management, in international trade and in international digital identity. Um, and so, you know, again, we are not a technology company, but we are focused on um, populations that are currently excluded from opportunity. And what is it that they need out of this entire digital experience that gives them agency um, and helps them to pursue the opportunity? And so we've really been uh, pretty interested, you know, Philip, um, MIT and, D and JFF work together on a number of projects which um, think, you know, about how the credential and the opportunity simultaneously can be built up together, right? But I think the issue of interoperability is really important because it is that I want one wallet for my transcript and my accredible badges. Um, and um, when, even when everyone implements a standard, though, it, like, I think the interpretation of the implementation is different. And so what we have been doing is, you know, again, as like a non-technology invested um, organization is to say, we would like there to be a market place where a lot of these digital wallets can exist, um, where, you know, students, um, job seekers, you know, people in the community can pick whatever tool they want, right? Like, you know, my Pixel has like my Google wallet and your iPhone has your Apple Pay. Um, so whatever a student wants, they can have all of their credentials. So we have been working with um, 
I think in our, we've been conducting these plug fests where people move credentials around, um, issue into various wallets, and wallets receive credentials from various providers. We have had a cohort, I think, of 41 different companies participate in the last round, where there were approximately 81 different demonstrations of interoperability. So LearnCard participated. You received credentials from a half a dozen or so different credential issuers. Credential issuers were able to move their credentials into a number of different wallets, including the LearnCard, the Learn credential wallet. Um, and I think ultimately this flexibility for a learner to choose how they present themselves and what tools they use is really important. And maybe one, so yeah. completely agree and I think there's interoperability at the standards level. So W3C VC is a good starting point. It's solid. It's ready for use. <coughs> it is interoperable. Um, but then there's also interoperability at the implementation level. And I think the PlugFest has been super important to get both get the community together, but then also actually see, like, can you move those credentials from one wallet to another or not? You know, because we can all say, well, we are implementing W3C, VC, but then when it comes to the point where it's like, well, how do you actually get the credential out of this wallet into a different wallet? Oh, there's no button or there's no, it doesn't quite work that way. And um, I love the fact that you used the web analogy because... Um, uh, in my recollection, uh, there was actually agreement on HTTP very early on, and the alternative was AOL and CompuServe and all these other closed services that fortunately lost out. Um, but if we hadn't had HTTP, we wouldn't have the web and we wouldn't have all these other you know, things today. And um, so I know you're already implementing the open standards, right? so I think you're on the side of HTTP. We need to make sure that the people who are not doing HTTP kind of we pull them into this boat so that, well, one, that they don't become AOL and CompuServe and go away, but also we just need more people in the boat, right? It's not about who's gonna win in the end. It's really the learners should win, the institutions should win, like the system should win, and we're all working together on making that happen. I think one, you know, one thing that's crucial to point out though is um, you know, where the analogy sort of breaks down using things like the web standards was there's a third party here, which is the issuers of the credentials also need to be really comfortable with these standards, the implementations of the standards. And, you know, a lot of them uh, very rightly so feel like the credentials they issue, they have to be very conservative about them and change has to be very slow because it's a huge part of their output. Um, and they, um, I think, are very interested in uh, sort of interoperability. I think they're interested in sort of learner control. You know, I've never heard any dissenting opinion against that. I think it's the specific way that it's implemented. They need to make sure they feel that's been done right. Uh, of course, it's sort of very difficult to reverse once it's out. So there is this third group, unlike, you know, the analogy of the web where the issuers of the credentials, not just the technology companies implementing um, the platforms. I, I think that's an important point. I mean, I do, the DCC does have Harvard and MIT as its members. They're pretty conservative institutions, pretty concerned about their brand and reputation. Um, and also actually Tech de Monterey is sitting here in the audience. It's not just US, it's also other international partners. But I completely agree with you. Like, we, they need to be able to trust that this isn't going to go away in the next few years. I mean, registrars think in like 200 year time frames, you know, <laughs> we're thinking in like two week, you know, what's happening in, with AI and all that stuff. So yeah, it, we have to kind of speak their language. We have to have systems that actually give them the, the reliability that, they, that they're looking for. So I want to take us in a new direction. I, I, so learning and deployment records, verifiable credentials, digital wallets, it's great. We all think it's great. But why is it not winning out? Like, what do we need to do to, you know, and I, and I want to come back to you really quick just because, you know, I read a study that you did that I thought was really great, and you said something in it that kind of freaked me out. It was like, employers, I don't know that they really are asking for this or needing this, you know? And I think that's a true thing. And I'm wondering, why is that? And what is it that we can do, or what is the roadblock that's causing us to not spread like wildfire? I'll, I'll be quick because I've talked too much. I'd love to hear from actually the people working on the ground implementing the stuff, where, what they're seeing. But we had a conversation yesterday with large tech companies about why is this not moving faster. <clears throat> and it was interesting, actually. I thought they were going to talk about building the infrastructure for it. All they talked about is it solves their own need to hire more diverse talent. And so there's huge pressure right now on the demand side where people can't hire the people that they're looking for, they can't fill the positions that they have. The traditional systems, like the bachelor's degree, is excluding way too many people. So they're all struggling to find a better solution. There is demand. I think the, the piece that's holding that back is like, 
the solutions don't work with the existing systems yet. Like it doesn't plug into the hiring, the talent, uh, what are they called, ATS systems in a way that they would expect them to do. So we're kind of a little bit too far from that. Um, what's your take on this? I mean, I know you're operating you know, a platform at scale. Um, are you seeing demand for these types of technologies? Uh, no, I guess is the short answer. I mean, I've never met a student who wants to combine a parchment transcript with an accredible certificate. Um, I mean, I don't mean to be so blunt about it, but I've just never met that, I've never met that student. I have met students who feel like they learn more at the institution than their transcript represented, that their co-curricular activities, the competency, they wanted more scaffolding for how do they represent that they can write well, speak well, think analytically, or comfortable with numbers. Um, and similarly, employers actually don't have a trust issue with educational credentials. Think about the current way in which they just trust a LinkedIn unverified statement uh, or just students making claims on resumes. Yes, there's a graduation and degree verification market, but it's usually in highly regulated, very compliance-oriented industries. Generally, they're very comfortable with education claims. What they don't know is the content of what does it mean to be certified in this or certified in that or could I have a two-year nursing degree versus a four-year nursing degree versus doing something at the hospital program. So again, I would harp back to the thing that we need to solve is not the, the technology, the medium, which is important because, you know, interoperability, applicant tracking systems, you know, if we communicate all of these data and they're not interoperable, then it's not going to get anywhere. But I think what really will unlock it is when we find the fit between what credential issuers and what credential receivers want to know substantively about a learner that's going to help them feel like they're solving a skill gap. Matthew, have you ever met a learner who is trying to combine credentials from Bunker Hill Community College with Roxbury Community College? Well, so now you're gonna get me really riled up because yes, and you know, um, so, so much of the conversation is around, which makes sense, is around the connection between education and the workforce. But within education, we don't have the ability to transfer and articulate records for credit transfer in the context of education. So I do know lots of students who have transcripts at multiple places, who have earned credit through AP, through summer learning, through community college, and the frustration they have collecting and managing all of their boring transcripts in one place, getting the data out and understanding which institutions are going to give them credit, not just to the degree, but the degree major, that is, I think, where we have a tremendous opportunity to empower learners with unified credentials that actually can be turned into opportunities. And I'm going to also plus one the like combination, because I feel like a lot of people who have full transcripts may not want to combine it with um, a non-degree credential, but there are, I think, the, the last count was 39 million adults in the U.S. that have attended some college but not have attained a degree. And I think for that population, which may not be using the parchment services, there may be a greater interest in combining their different attestations. Not to mention the populations that, you know, even after graduating from college then, you know, go down a very different career pathway and they take alternative education as well, which can supplement. Um, yeah, I, I, echoing what Matthew said, um, Look, taking the HTTP analogy a, a little step further, when I'm on a website, I don't care about the underlying hypertext transfer protocol layer. I care about the information I'm getting from the website. That's why I'm there. Um, and I think that employers don't care about the um, underlying technology. Um, I think they care about um, understanding what this person's skills are, what their experience is. And so that's where I think it's really important to focus. Um, the, the most important thing we can do here is um, just make the technology sort of seamless and feel behind the scenes. Um, and it's not about popularizing LERs. I think it's about popularizing the impact that LERs can have um, or other, you know, again, things like the digital badging standards and so on and why that's so important, such as interoperability. You know, I want to I wanna add one more layer to this too. You know, we, uh, you know, so our chairman, John, is here, and he helped us at LEGO Foundation to see the importance of informal education in this system as well, and the importance of eff efficacy to, uh, to look back at holistic uh, education as part of this broader ecosystem. You know, do LERs help us with that as well to bring, you know, we're talking a lot about formal education right now, you know, community colleges, K through 12, and that's really important, but, you know, uh, we've been looking at what's the importance of also being able to combine what's happening in the informal setting and be able to kind of understand its relationship with, with that lifelong learning journey. Is, is any work happening in any, of your, um, in any of your projects in the informal space or is it all just formal?
Oh, I mean, okay, so, Please. sorry, I, I wasn't, so informal being like outside of the school. Is exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, we're working on a project yeah. together um, where there's a lot of informal learning. So we're, ta we're deploying verifiable credentials, digital wallets um, in three different use cases. Um, I think all three of them are informal learning experiences. We're working um, with Participate um, and Black Girl Ventures on yeah. entrepreneurship as careers, um, thinking about are there credentials that help um, uh, black and brown women who are entrepreneurs um, access opportunity. And then, you know, Thinking about, I think your earlier point about, does the credential itself actually provide an opportunity? And I think the answer by default is no, unless you generate that opportunity while the credential is being used. And so thinking about what is that entire credential life cycle, and you know, designing with how it will be used in addition to the fact that it exists. So I think, you know, you, you mentioned Lego. Legos are exactly the interoperability analogy. They are different colors and different shapes, but they all have the little, like, like I don't know what it's called, that round piece that allows them to connect to each other. Um, and I think people will continue to collect learning and employment experiences all through their lives. And, uh, you know, as long as they have that little round piece, they can be built together and allow a person to communicate the totality of their abilities. I think one of the most exciting things I've seen around this, I hesitate to use the informal versus form, formal dichotomy. Um, I prefer more sort of career advancing versus non-career advancing um, because one of the things I think we've, we've really loved seeing is uh, some universities, uh, for example, say in a very formal setting, are supplementing the traditional credential, which is a, just a statement. This person graduated, you know, maybe plus a GPA. Um, with things like the extracurricular learning that happened around, you know, that learning pathway and what, what, what we do when we go through, say, a four-year degree or any, any learning experience, we sort of hemorrhage all this information about who you are and what you loved and what you could do and we summarize you into a number or a letter. And I think we need that because employers need that and there are systems that we've adopted that require that. But also you can have this sort of supplemental sort of evidence portfolio and um, that can also be curated and created by the learner. And um, so it's not so much informal and, and formal. It's um, would, would this help make an argument for you about why you could do this job well or this opportunity well? Okay, I think you're exactly right. And I, I should have said that and I should have like noted that in your the way that you asked that question, right? So I think that we sometimes use language in, in careless ways where we we say like there's like a degree and then there's like something else or there's like formal learning which counts and then there's like play which doesn't right and we often are dismissive of the non sort of institutional learning in a way that I think is like careless yeah I agree well and speaking of that you know we're gonna get to some questions here but maybe one final question um, how do LERs or learning and deployment records help us with equity challenges because I think that's another thing. We, again, we're talking about formal versus informal, you know, uh, what that even means in terms of, you know, its advancement towards a career. But what about those who are uncredentialed? You know, what about those who are kind of unlearned? Does, is this, or does this offer any, any access or any improvements in the way that we've done the system over the last 100 years? I think one of the major benefits in standardizing this achievement means X, or this student or learner can do X because of this achievement um, can really help um, if it doesn't come from a, you know, a Harvard or an Oxford or whatever. Um, if there isn't a sort of traditional reputation, but you can provide all this evidence for your, your skill, um, that can really help level the playing field. And then LERs are um, you know, one of the big, big sort of foundational initiatives behind it is to be able to communicate the what, not just the, sorry, the how, not just the what of the credential. Yeah, I think it's one of the um, terrible ironies that an effort to drive greater equity in the workforce, which was a push for employers to find more neutral basis to make hiring decisions um, and not work off of certain biases, which ultimately led to the four-year degree being this common requirement for all sorts of jobs for which the four-year degree really wasn't necessarily aligned in terms of the actual education and training and cost. And then the inequities in attainment and the status hierarchy of higher education, that effort to try to find a rational basis of hiring in terms of credentialing drove towards this single credential that actually has a ton of inequities that are baked into it. So I think the more we can get to skills um, and recognize that skills are developed through a broad set of experiences, I think the more we're opening up the opportunity for people to be discovered for what they can do and not just you know, these more indirect kinds of measures. Yeah, I would add equity is the reason why I got interested in this space. Um, and I think there's a 
big piece of the design of the technology that can enable equity, but I also have come to learn, for me, myself, that technology alone is not really going to make a big difference. Um, you know, the systems have inequity baked in in, in, a, in many, many different ways. Uh, we can use the technology, I think, to pry that open a little bit and like, show the alternatives. Um, and, you know, that's what we're trying to do. For example, you know, you mentioned the four-year degree, which, um, I mean, there is that famous um, burning glass study where it's like some percentage of executive assistant, like the, the job postings all require four-year degrees, but most of the people in those jobs successfully today don't have those degrees. So it's just kind of the inconsistency is like so mind-boggling. But unless there is an alternative, which I think is what we're trying to build, it's like the employers are not going to change that because it's just, you know, it's, they're used to this now, it's worked up to now. And so... The, the challenge is really on us to, to design those systems that reflect skills and, and experiences and competencies in more reliable ways, and then articulating that to the employers. And building technology is a big piece of that. But we also have to have the conversations with the employers. Why is this important? Who are we excluding? And like a lot of the things that will make this really uh, tackle equity have nothing to do with the technology. So we have about four minutes left. Do we, we could probably take two or three questions. if. If there's any. Here. Well, I've, we, we've been doing a lot of thinking about this. Thank, thank you for the question, by the way. Um, when you, so right now, if we're trying to uncover that kind of information, um, okay, great, your credentials are great, but what can you do as a result? What have you done afterwards? You know, um, the way that we get that information today as an employer is in an interview, and you have to sort of tease it out in an interview. And here's the problem. Um, there are two types of people you basically can't tell the difference between, people who are genuinely telling the truth and people who are bullshitting. Um, and you just, you just you, I guess we have reference checks and we try, um, but it's an art, not a science. And I think one of the things we're most excited about is a credential today is a, a snapshot in time. You know, you graduated, you have a GPA, good for you, great. Um, and then, so it's a, it's a heuristic and it's a summary, a low resolution summary too. Um, I think we see a future where credentials are not just a snapshot, they can evolve over time. You can add supplemental achievements or evidence to existing credentials. Um, you know, with varying levels of, you know, um, formality, varying levels of uh, impact. Um, and I think that digital credentials are a really great vehicle to be able to sort of have this sort of evolving, breathing credential over time. So I'd love to see it get more scientific over time and standardized. Um, and, th you know, things like, you know, the LER are sort of initiatives trying to push it in that direction to make them not so much of a snapshot. And, and actually, I would add one thing, which is that in the LER, we talk a lot about the L, the learning piece. Um, we talk very little about the E piece. And I would actually encourage employers, because they're tracking those things as people are going through, recruit, uh, not recruitment, but like internal talent management processes, you know, promotions, those kind of things. Track those kinds of things as part of that process as verifiable credentials. It's useful to the companies themselves as they're managing their talent. But also, those people could then, if they do decide to leave, they could take that with them and, and share it with another employer. And this, by the way, is why the individual having ownership of the credentials is so critical, um, because the employers are not incentivized to release the information because then their employees get poached. So you need to make sure it's the individual that sort of has control of that narrative. So it does look like we're just about out of time here. So, so what do we do this? Like, a 10 seconds, like, final thoughts. <laughs> Enjoy lunch. <laughs> I, won't, I miss the AOL CD. That's <laughs> okay, fair. Um, I'm excited. I think this is the year that digital credentials become mainstream. Um, you know, we're seeing very conservative organizations issuing credentials digitally um, as the primary format, so I'm excited for that. Yeah, and I would just add, I think we have to do the hard work of matching the focus on the technology 
with the focus, which is very contextualized to particular occupational fields and so on, with the substance, the content. What is it that an employer wants to know that a university isn't yet representing, but assesses and is part of the educational experience that's gonna help create better matches? Great, well I really appreciate you all, and I thank you all for coming, and you know, like I said, we did actually create a badge for the session, so if you'd like to claim it, just find Jackson or Taylor at the back. So thank you all, and have a great is, rest of your session. Is the badge a verifiable credential? It's a verifiable credential, and it did, yeah. <laughs>